We are here live streaming uh, from Cockatoo Island in Sydney at the F2F uh, Summit. This is an event we've had three times now uh, where we bring together a, a number of, of clients, uh, industry participants. We're expecting 1,500 people here today uh, and the aims are to celebrate agriculture and the role, the important role it plays in uh, our society and economies, uh, but also to discuss the uh, issues that will be shaping the industry uh, over the next 20 years or so. This morning we've been focusing on discussing with the Rabo research team uh, some of those issues. Um, we've addressed uh, a, a, a number of things. Uh, we started off discussing the impact of tech on land prices, moved on to how we can better help consumers uh, make complex decisions around what's going on in their supply chain for a better result, both for sustainability but for agriculture. Um, then moved on to what's happening in New Zealand from a sustainability perspective and on to uh, cotton in Australia before discussing with Mick. So a lot of space um, talking about tech, uh, talking about annual crops and livestock. But of course, a very important part of our industry is more permanent planted crops, uh, including a lot of, of fruit and nuts. Uh, here in Australia, we have been experienced what we're characterizing as a renaissance of that industry with, with um, good growth opportunities, uh, a lot of better pricing, and a lot of investment flowing in. So with me here this morning on live stream, um, I'd like to introduce, uh, to discuss this renaissance, our uh, senior port and wine analyst, uh, actually based in Hastings, New Zealand, here with us on Cockatoo Island today, Hayden Higgins. Good morning, Hayden. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Hayden, kick us off by explaining um, what are some of the drivers of this renaissance in, a, in Australian fruit and nut industries? Yes, thanks, Tim. Well, some of the key drivers we've really, really been seeing are, are things like um, the rising consumer demand for convenience of products, so products yep. that are easy to eat and, and, and uh, source from supermarkets yep. and, and shelves. So that's in both uh, developed and developing economies. Yep. We're also seeing growth in um, health and wellness awareness. So a lot of the attributes with fresh fruit and nuts kind of fit into that from a nutrition perspective. We're also seeing a big growth in demand for uh, products that fit food safety and food quality um, attributes, particularly in developing economies where maybe they may not have as much trust in their local domestic food production systems. Yep. Uh, and, and tying into that has been quite a lift in rising incomes across the middle classes through Asia as their yep. GDP is growing on economic growth and that's been flowing into uh, rising food consumption but also yep. fresh produce and um, and I think this has really set the scene as we're saying for a really big growth curve in the imports of fresh fruits but also uh, nuts in particular. Yep. So we're, we're talking about uh, rising incomes underpinning this, mm -hmm. um, convenience, taste uh, no, no doubt. Um, but health is a big part of it too, right? Mm. As consumers look to adopt a more healthy uh, diet, that often starts with, with fruit and nuts. Yes, yes, yep. oh, it definitely does. And, and you, so you see those characteristics there and, and, and you can look at almonds as a good example of a lot of those attributes that I was talking about flowing through. So around also premium is a, is a key component there. So viewed as a premium product, but certainly the nutrient makeup of almonds around um, the protein levels that are in there. Yep. So that's part of a, a balanced diet. Uh, and you've also got other factors and other fresh products and fruits around various vitamins, such as with table grapes, um, that are, are beneficial from a health and wellness perspective. So yep. fresh produce really fits well into that, that story. Yep. So when we talk about these products being on, on a growth curve to, mm -hmm. to some extent globally, uh, how would you characterise that? Well, I'd characterise it as, as, as extremely strong. And if we, if we think about um, you know, the overall global imports of fresh fruits since 2001, we've seen that go up by almost half in volume terms. Right. Um, but if we add nuts into that, and this is where they really set a, a cracking pace for want of a better term, yep. is, is you add the nuts into that figure and that comes to around about two-thirds growth in import volume since 2001. So yep. whilst fresh fruits have really grown, nuts have really driven significant category growth. And to kind of put that into perspective, there's only two fruit categories, which are avocados and melons, which have actually outgrown almonds from an import volume growth basis over right. that period. So right. 
pretty significant. Yep. And, and import growth can come from, from two directions at least. Mm. Uh, one is improved consumption, yes. which, which, which is the best place. The other one is just displacing local production. Which is driving this? Mm. Well, you're seeing uh, a lot of consumption demand growth occurring in these countries. So what we're seeing is the import growth is actually supplementing consumption demand within those countries. Um, and so it's not necessarily displacing that local production. I think what we're witnessing is an overall rise of consumption, which has been driving um, production growth at a lot of exporting countries um, yep. to, to meet that global demand. Yep. All right, so that's the global picture. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, really structural trends underpinning rising consumption of, of fruit and nuts, and that led into really good growth mm -hmm. in, in import volumes in key markets offshore. Yes. Um, how does uh, the Australian New Zealand production sector tap into that? So we've been tapping into a lot of it, uh, particularly through the permanent planted crops, Tim, so thinking yep. things like citrus, table grapes, almonds, kiwi yep. fruit, pit fruit, uh, avocados of course, can't yep. not talk about fresh fruit without talking about avocados. Yep. Um, and, and these crops are growing really well across both Australia and New Zealand and we grow them very well and they meet a lot of these attributes, so it's not surprising that, that they're meeting that rising global demand because those core crops I've mentioned are yep. also some of the biggest growth crops globally in terms of um, import demand. Yeah, okay. Mm. So often when we talk about growth of, of global import demand uh, around the world, it tends to be a China story. Is yes. this just a China story? Well, it's not just a China story, but, but I think we should go back a step and look at what's occurred for Australia in general is a really yep. good example. So you know, back in 2007, the EU and the US were our, our largest kind of fresh fruit export markets. Yep. And China was important when you include Hong Kong and Taipei. Often there was the grey channel aspect of, of fruit and nuts going in that way. Uh, and then rounding out that was New Zealand. But since 2007, with that big growth demand coming out of China, we've really seen that come to the fore, that no surprise it is now our largest market for fresh fruit and nut exports. Yep. Um, the others remain strong, but they haven't had the same level of volume import growth yep. uh, over that period. And, and the same also applies for New Zealand, Tim. You're seeing the same growth and import volumes into China, also supported by free trade agreements, I must yep. add, for both countries. And, and that's more around the kiwi fruit story, uh, fresh apples and cherries and other of those permanent crops. Yep. Um, so China's really important, but, but it's not just China. We've got other countries that are rapidly rising, import nations across Asia, such as Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam. Yep. And, and so they're really growing their imports. But I think it's really keen to, to also highlight here that uh, China is such a big growth engine of the economic part of the world there. Yep. Um, and a lot of their GDP growth has flowed into those other economies where they are natural trading partners. Yep. So I think what we're seeing is, as, as all of those countries' economic prosperity has improved, they've also um, increased their importation of food products. Yep. And, and so whilst it's not a total China story, there is a really big link back into China on that success yep. Interesting. in Asia. Yeah. So good growth offshore, uh, good opportunity to fill that uh, through our exports, their, yes. their imports. Uh, they look like fairly structural growth trends, which is always nice. But presumably we're not the only one targeting these markets. So who are our key competitors uh, in these product lines in those markets? Mm. Well, that's right. And so the same uh, levers that we're, so, sorry, signals that we're seeing coming from the markets, uh, our competitors are seeing. And so they're pulling the same response levers around yep. growing production and looking to increase exports or changing the nature of the markets they export to. And so that's the yep. likes of Mexico, uh, Peru, Chile, uh, the USA, uh, and, and to a certain degree South Africa across those various product groups. And, and so what we're seeing is more competition in markets, but that's not always a bad thing because it's also helping to actually grow uh, the overall category awareness right. and consumption. So whilst competition can bring challenges, we also see um, sometimes New Zealand and Australia uh, fit that counter seasonal window too. So yep. uh, there's benefits and, and, and we won't say negatives, but challenges with each of those yep. supply responses. Yep. So what does all this opportunity mean for horticultural industries in this region, Hayden? Uh, look, I think what we're really seeing is um, a big focus on production growth and, and that can bring some, some challenges, uh, Tim, mm -hmm. as, as we grow. Um, it's created opportunities for um, diversification of markets, which is always really important. Yep. Um, and you know, diversification of markets is easy to say, but it's, it's something that we should focus on uh, over time. Yep. 
So also you and I have just discussed and we're starting to discuss with our clients also, there are a range of secondary impacts of mm. this rise of, of permanent plantings on broader Australian agriculture, aren't there, Hayden? As, yes. as these uh, investors planting these permanent crops that are doing so well uh, start to compete with resources. That's right. And so what we tend to see, and I was having a discussion around this this morning uh, with some attendees here at the, at the F2F, is um, you tend to see an individual sector will go on a growth trajectory, and that could either be an individual grower or the sector as a whole focused on the profile for their product, yep. but that's often not in tandem or consideration to other sectors. And so what you tend to see rapidly happens is demand for resources tends to converge at a point, and then we end up having kind of competition within our yep. own market yep. before we even get to the export markets where we're trying to uh, compete. So, so that's kind of an overarching theme, but there are other challenges that, that this brings. Yep. Mm. And competition for resources, I presume you're talking mainly about uh, water and labour. Water and labour and land as well. Um, yep. and, and so, you know, if we think about water demand, it's, it's very topical and, and, and of focus for Australia. And so, you know, what we are seeing is we see this rise in uh, planting of uh, permanent crops to, to support this global yep. demand growth. Yep. Um, that is obviously competing with other water users. So, in what is a highly complex and regulated system, that brings um, uh, challenges um, around availability and, and also affordability of water, uh, which has figuratively speaking, downstream effects um, for other water users in terms of ability to access. So from, that's from the Australian perspective. From a New Zealand perspective around water, it's, it's a bit of a different story. New Zealand doesn't have such uh, a shortage of water, so to speak. It has one of the highest availability volumes of fresh water globally. It's more around how New Zealand captures that water, stores it and uses it um, yeah. over time. And so if we look at both of those water examples, really the key, I think, to the success of agriculture and horticulture in both of those countries is, um, is ongoing education, collaboration and consultation between all the stakeholders, be they yep. growers, be they government, be they be urban populace, to actually look for positive outcomes yeah. here. Yeah. It's interesting. There, so there is competition between almonds and other agriculture, in, in, to use a prominent example in Australia at the moment, and other mm. permanent crops. Uh, but there's also some symbiosis in it. I was speaking to someone in the almond industry recently was highlighting that, that they have a really strong vested interest in the ongoing uh, vibrancy uh, uh, of cropping and livestock industries because those same businesses and families sustain communities that in turn supply them with, with important uh, uh, manpower uh, for mm. their businesses. So competition on some levels, to some extent also though everyone has an interest in sustaining vibrant industries uh, to, to build broad, broader infrastructure and, and capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's right. And that's a, that's a good point, Tim, because you, you raise an interesting thought there where if you think about how you see a growth in one crop, ultimately it's displacing another type of farming enterprise or crop. Yep. So what you tend to see is that that crop either moves to another region yep. or potentially even moves out of the system. And so you do get that relocation of production away from maybe labour forces or, or maybe it takes a labour pool with it yep. or it takes a community with it. But it also starts to move away from where maybe some of the post-harvest type infrastructure assets are to support that crop. Yep. So there are those dynamics which change in the landscape, but definitely, as you say, for some of those permanent crops, they are relying on what's going on in those communities to support yep. their growth. Yep. And um, Hayden, we're talking about investment uh, flowing into this sector. Uh, how is that being funded in, in permanent plantings uh, in fruit and nuts? And how is that different to what we'd see more broadly in agriculture, in broad acre cropping or livestock? So we are seeing a big, uh, big growth there as we talk about growth in productive assets and growth in demand for post-harvest assets, either currently or downstream to, to deal with that production and then further through the supply chain. And that all obviously comes with a significant requirement of capital. So, yep. you know, neither, um, you know, banks and or um, individual companies or businesses' balance sheets retain earnings can fund all of that growth. So yep. you're seeing um, the increase in, in syndication of investments or outside capital coming in to support these projects, yep. be it from uh, investors onshore or offshore. Yep. Uh, and we expect to see a continuation of that theme occurring, Tim, to help supply that, that big demand for capital uh, as we move forward, yep. um, along with a mix of bank funding and um, individual business yep. balance sheet funding. And why is that particularly prominent in this space and less so in some of the other sectors that we uh, deal with? 
because it's quite capital intensive to, to buy these assets, um, right. develop them, and there's a, quite a time lag often between the terminate crops from planting to full production yep. um, till income starts coming through, uh, and a really high upfront capital cost versus uh, maybe some other types of farming enterprise. And so also you've got a really positive story that's been seeing uh, and some good returns yep. coming through globally uh, and for a lot of these businesses. So that's, that's attractive for investors to, yep. to put capital into when maybe they're looking at returns and other investment classes might not be what they have been yep. at a property or yep. purely just diversification as well, Tim. Yep. So it's a story uh, and an investment thesis that, that seems to hang somewhat on growth in offshore markets, uh, certainly in the case in New Zealand, mm. but increasingly in Australia, opportunities are opening up there. Um, as, as we look to supply China's increasing demand for these, uh, these types of products and to a broader extent Asia, are there some challenges around those markets we need to be aware of? Look, I think there is, Tim, and um, you know, the, without the time we've got, I think the key one I'd like to highlight is really you know, participants within the sector just really being aware about that downside risk that remain across China and Greater Asia. And, and when I say that, it's more around the economic slowdown in China and the continuation yep. of that. So, and if we think back to our earlier comments around some of China's growth driving growth in those other economies, a slowdown in China will therefore naturally flow through to some of those other uh, countries if they uh, China source, say, manufactured goods or components for manufactured goods. Yep. Um, and so that is likely to lead to a potential slowdown in, in consumption growth around food. So uh, we're not saying it's imminent, but it's more something to be aware of that, that yep. they are potential challenges. And again, that comes back to our earlier comment around diversification of markets, which, again, we acknowledge takes time, but is an, yep. it should be an important focus moving yep. forward. And, and that is the double-edged sword of, of benefiting from income growth in the mm. last decade in these regions, isn't it? That uh, if that's what's pulled you up, pulled consumers up into a middle class that's able to afford fruit and, and nuts and looking to consume more of it, you have to be willing to ride out that if income growth slows, mm. th that is going to impact demand for your product, presumably. That's right, and, and the other important factor in there is, is the lead times, as I alluded to earlier, yeah. around some of these crops. So, you know, you might make some planting intentions based on what we're seeing today in today's environment. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that's that earlier comment around individual sectors making their own growth trajectory and growth plans, but with a lead time of up to seven years for some of these crops, in seven years you'll see increased domestic production, you'll see increased uh, global production from our competitors, and that may all hit the market at a time where you can't forecast that far forward what is going on with GDP growth in China or consumption demand in Europe or wherever it may be. Yep, yep. And Hayden, we're talking about the demand side and all the opportunity there. Um, we, we talk about uh, this sector at the moment being able to compete for resources mm. because the returns are, are, are strong at the moment. Um, what about from a sustainability pressure? Are there any challenges for the sector there it needs to address? Look, certainly, Tim, sustainability, as we all know, is becoming a, a growing focus globally, not, not just for food uh, producers, but right across uh, supply chains. And, and, and we see a lot of awareness of that from consumers, from NGOs, from government, um, and so a lot of focus there. But I think the thing with sustainability is that it's just not black and white, and it's very complex and quite broad. And, and every market treats it different in terms of some of the attributes they focus on. So in, in Europe, it might be around greenhouse gas emissions or water usage. Um, in other parts of the world, it may be on plastics. And, and we see, you know, in, in, in Asia and particularly China, there's a growing awareness around sustainability. But as I mentioned, the really big focus is on food safety and food quality. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but they're probably dealing into the, sorry, when they, when they buy into purchasing produce from Australia or New Zealand, they're buying into our clean green image story, the fact that we are high quality and safe producers. Yep. So they're probably associating some of those characteristics yep. with, um, with sustainability. And, and so what those signals are sending to producers is, let's focus on how we increase efficiencies, how we um, run best practice to ensure that you know, we can live up to these, these credentials. And I think that's the key thing for uh, people to be aware of is, is how these yep. things evolve over time. Yep. Okay, so it, it's been a, a positive story, Hayden. Mm. We're, we're talking about good market growth off the back of offshore demand supplied from export regions such as ours, uh, built on a, on a story of rising incomes, desire for health, convenience, taste. Mm. Uh, and we've been able to supply that by, uh, to some extent, just uh, capitalising on resource availability, which has taken resources mm. from other sectors. Uh, 
but a uh, uh, sector that's really, as we started off under a period of renaissance, do you expect that to continue for some time? What Will the next five years see this story continue for horticulture in this region? Look, our expectation, yes, Tim, would be that we see continued consumption um, or demand growth for these products occurring globally overseas, as you're just seeing populations rise, and there will be changes to that over time around influences of economic growth, which may yep. slow it down. But you know, if I talk to our colleagues in China, um, they did some forecasting around growth in food consumption in China over the next five years, and it was up to around, I think it was half a trillion US dollars. Now, yep. that was done two years ago based on a 6% GDP growth. So we're slowing to that area now. So if we use China as a barometer, um, we would still expect that consumption growth to increase, albeit yep. there'll be ebbs and flows in that. And then they flow into other ages. So I think the short version of that is, yes, we should see continued consumption yep. demand growth, which will flow into productivity growth. But I think the key message for uh, participants to be aware of is, is over time building knowledge and awareness of what's happening globally with competitors and where yep. their production's heading and, and what their uh, responses are so that as I said when you yep. come to seven years time after you've planted your crop if that's your crop who may be your competition in the market yep. and is that internal or is that external okay well thanks for joining me here this morning Hayden um, as, as we touch on the important renaissance of this industry but the prospects for further continuation mm -hmm. of that wonderful thanks very much Tim it's great to talk yep. We've been here this morning live streaming from Cockatoo Island at the Rabobank F2F uh, Summit. Uh, the, the guests have arrived. Uh, the bells will still be ringing, uh, soon be ringing for main stage. I've been this morning meeting with uh, members of the Rabobank research team discussing important issues for this sector. Uh, you can follow our team uh, through our weekly podcast on uh, the Rabo Research Podcast channel, which you can find searching for Rabobank on your podcast channel on, on your iPhone uh, or, or iPad or, or Android. Um, this afternoon, we're going to come back at, at 1.05 and I'm going to be interviewing speakers from the main stage. We have many of our clients and friends here. We know not everyone could make it. We want to bring you as much of the insights as we can share, though, via this live stream. So join me at 1.05 for the next session, where we'll be discussing, amongst other things, the seven mega trends that scientists feel that food producers should be most aware of, artificial intelligence in agriculture, and new ways of dealing with ag. I hope you can join me then. Bye for now.